entirely. So uh, I, over here, I'm presenting the a simplified version of the Mint Maker, and I'm uh, so so uh, just on notice that this code is simplified compared to the real code, it's substantially simplified, uh, but it has the essence of what it means to be uh, representing. Uh, um, uh, transferable electronic rights through the abstractions that we've created. Um, so, so this function as a whole is called make mint, and it's a pure function. It doesn't, it doesn't have a reference to, to anything else. Uh, and each time we call the function, um, uh, it makes a new mint, which is a logically separate currency. Sonny, can you? I, I, okay, you might. Can you just if, if I'm blocking you, you can, okay. Uh, it makes a logically separate currency. So there's. So each time you call make mint, it makes an issuer, it makes a ledger, and it makes a mint object. So those are the three things. Uh, every time you call make mint, so let's make four separate currencies. So in each plane, the three objects are in bed with each other, but the planes are completely isolated from each other. No copy. Okay. Uh, and now the mint of a given currency is the thing that if you have the mint, you can inflate the currency. You can expand the money supply. So to create our initial conditions, we're going to invoke the mint, creating the uh, purse containing new hundred units. And we're going, and I'm just, I'm just going to say a hundred dollars, but it's sort of easy, easiest for my time. Uh, and we're going to give the purse of a hundred dollars. To Alice. We're just going to endow it to her in order to get started with our scenario. We're going to invoke the mint again to create the mint, the purse we give to Bob. So we call these the main purses. These are the ones that represent Alice's prior relationship, prior trust relationship to her account at the bank, if you will. Um, and also, um, uh, you know, we can assume that Alice and Bob both know this issuer directly, so they have a prior trust relationship with the issuer as standing for a given currency. Okay. So now, uh, using uh, these abstractions with the purse having this protocol, so first of all, I should make, explain the ledger here is a, is a map um, uh, from purse identity, from the identity of the purse as an unforgeable capability. From a map from that identity to some number, which is the balance associated with the purse. So, so don't think of the balance as being in the purse. Think of the purses as just being an identity associated with the balance to be the ledger. That's using like a JavaScript weak map. map. Yeah, yeah. To code it in JavaScript, we use a weak map. What we're going to do, you know, what, what we need to do, the engineering we need to do to do this for real is we need to let the ledger be much larger than an object we fit into a JavaScript address space. So we need to do the work so that it spills, but this is the semantics we're going to implement. And this is the semantics we've implemented right now in the JavaScript address space. Okay. So the way uh, Alice um, pays Bob is she sends, a, she starts by sending a withdrawal message to her main purse, uh, my purse bang withdrawal of 10. Notice the bang there. Alice can be running on a completely separate chain. Bob could be running on a, on a completely separate third chain. These could just be three completely separate chains in the world uh, that are mutually, that where the chains are mutually suspicious. But this initial conditions means that with regard to a certain narrow set of issues, Alice and Bob are assumed to trust the issuer with those issues, but not with anything outside that, that, that range of issues. So Alice sends this withdrawal method. Uh, the withdraw method, um, as we can see here, um, internally it makes an empty purse and then it transfers money into it. So diagrammatically, we're just going to show that as uh, Alice's main purse creates a new payment purse. And then out of Alice's $100, $10 of it gets transferred into the payment purse. And now Alice sends the buy message to Bob. Uh, so Bob, bang, buy, including payment purse and a description of what Alice wants to buy. And 
when it arrives at Bob, we have, a, we have the, the dilemma that causes the E rights level of abstraction to be very clearly different than the capability level of abstraction. This is why in our work we distinguish capabilities from E rights is that as far as Alice is concerned, she's done what she needs to do to pay Bob. But all Bob has received here is some object from, some, from someone who could call her. She doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know what it is. So um, uh, in order to get back all the properties that he needs to turn an opaque capability that might be shared, the red here is Bob can't know whether Alice still shares the reference. Um, to turn that into exclusive access to fungible money, uh, what Bob does is he just sends it along to his main purse, uh, where the main purse, um, uh, on receiving the withdrawal method, the deposit method, um, looks up the payment purse in the ledger. And the fact that it finds the payment person ledger, notice, just using the identity, not talking to the payment purse. So the payment purse is just serving as an unforgeable identity here. Looks up number, sees that it's in the ledger, therefore it's legitimate, and transfers $10. Um, so, um, so the real ERTP is basically an elaboration on this protocol. Uh, but logically, it doesn't really introduce any issues that have not been introduced here. Okay. And now I'm going to do the thing that one should never, ever do in a presentation, which is do a slide full of code. Um, Could be worse to be doing now. Hey. <laughs> but um, the reason I wanted to put the entirety of this code up here and do a little bit of walking through it is we talk a lot about pegging and pegging hierarchies and all this. Given our e rights system, this does express a pegging relationship. So the make peg, ignore the e argument there. The whole e thing is just the way we do the infix bank. So when you see e remote issuer uh, close paren dot get label, just read that as remote issuer bang get label. That's all that he is doing. Um, so uh, is this asynchronous code? So that's asynchronous code. Okay. Yeah, that's right. There's some other asynchronous. Yeah, the the, the, the no, what, what the has suffix is a, is a promise. Yeah. 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 So so yeah. So the p suffix is the way we remember treat this as a promise to a potentially remote object. So if it has a P, our general assumption, unless stated otherwise, is the object you're talking to might be anywhere. So you make a peg by just saying what the parent issuer is, what the issuer is, not necessarily the root issuer, but just the thing that you're going to treat as the immediate upstream issuer. Um, uh, um, and the assay, make that assay, is just uh, part of the elaboration of ERTP for amounts that are not numbers for other kinds of non-fungible assets, so ignore that. Um, uh, the, the key thing, I'll, I'll just point out the key lines. The key, line, the key lines is, is this one. The backing purse is, notice no rights have been passed in here. The only thing passed in to create a pegging relationship is the remote issue. That's adequate to start the pegging relationship. Um, the, in response, when you make the peg, it then asks the remote issuer to make a, an empty purse, which it's going to treat as the backing purse, initially containing zero rights. But it will be a purse at the same location as that issuer. Okay. Um, then uh, uh, what it does is it creates a local issuer. Uh, which is just a completely fresh issuer just for the local units that want to be related to the remote units. Um, uh, uh, and then, um, and it also has a local mint, meaning that it has the, the, this peg abstraction because it uses the local mint, but it does not release it. This peg abstraction has the exclusive ability to engage in monetary policy with regard to the local mint. I'm sorry, the local issuer. Okay. Now, um, uh, the important thing now is it creates and returns this object 
that has four methods, get local issuer, get remote issuer, and then sequester all and redeem all. Sequester all, you give it a remote payment. You give it a reference to a purse containing some, some money of the remote currency. So this is basically a local representation of a capability to remotely held money. And what it does is it asynchronously deposits it into the backing purse, because the backing purse is remote. It has to do it asynchronously. Uh, it then does the dot then so that this further behavior is only triggered by a positive acknowledgment if the deposit either never happens or indicates an error, then the contents of the then do not get executed. Um, so uh, when the remote um, uh, backing purse acknowledges a successful deposit, then uh, this thing mints the corresponding amount of local money using the local mint. So it inflates the local currency when you do a sequester. So you've sequestered that much remote currency in the backing purse, and then you've minted the corresponding amount of local currency, and then the withdrawals, because in the real system, you make a distinction between purses and payments, and this converts, it, converts the, that local, you know, turns that purse into a payment which is returned, with regard to the ERTP I showed on the previous slide, that's noise. The main thing is it creates a purse holding local currency in exchange for having successfully sequestered that much remote currency. And the caller of sequester all is, is, is obtaining a promise for the local purse. It's not obtaining the local purse itself because you're depending on asynchronous operations. It gets getting promise for the local purse, and that promise only resolves successfully if all of this happens successfully. So it only resolves after the remote funds have been sequestered, and if the remote fund, and if the remote purse signals an error, then the promise propagates the signaling of the same error. Okay, and then so so this inflates the local currency, reflecting a sequester. And then when you take the local currency, when you take the local payment, and you want to redeem it to get back the remote rights directly, then you just um, slash is basically just a, a little convenience thing around the deposit of a locally created purse that you then throw away. So you're basically uh, engaged in the opposite of minting. You're just destroying that much local currency. And how, whatever much that amount was, you then withdraw it from the backing purse and return a promise for that amount. So redeem returns a promise for a remote capability to a purse that represents exclusive access to that amount withdrawn from the backing purse. And then, so that's a one hop of your peg, of the pegging trade. And then you can do multi-hop logic or trying to simulate a single currency that goes across the pegging by building logic on top of this. But this is the core logic that builds it out of separate issues. And that's it for this presentation. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, that corresponds to the thing you got up there, yeah, the burn so and yeah, burn and mint. Yeah. Yeah, the logical makes sense to me. Uh, one sort of question, maybe this is just because I don't have the intuition, but Reading this code, it is hard for me to guess how many actual messages get sent, like between the chains, requiring consensus verification when I make a call in JavaScript. Like sometimes it seems like it's one, but sometimes it could be several, or if I'm passing references, that requires this triangle thing. Is yeah. that something that you So, So the, the thing to count in order to understand cost is not the number of messages, it's the number of required round trips. Because sending a series of object messages in order, as far as lower level infrastructure is concerned, it's aggressively trying to batch those. So, um, uh, and so, so this, and this is where promise pipelining comes in. Make it very, we need it to be cheap to send a bunch of separate, tiny, semantic messages at the cost of a a a, a bundle of those that arrive approximately simultaneously. Um, uh, and all of your 
really hard costs is when you um, are waiting for something that logically takes a round trip between two points. Now, with regard to round trips, you can make the same criticism. Um, it's, you, you have to learn how to read this code for round trips, and this notation does not make that clear. So, to a first approximation, you count the number of then's involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The then, the then really is distinctly round trip logic. Yeah. And yeah. chained messages without a then, the intention is that those all pipeline out without, a, without any further dependency. So, so th the thing you can't tell by reading the code is where they're going to and if those messages are all going to the same target. It shouldn't be the yeah. e, the capital E something then. It, so. it, well, so it, it's a question of the thing inside the parentheses and the E. So yeah. the, the backing E backing first P dot deposit all. That's sending a message off to whichever bat, whichever machine is hosting the backing first. The object that you're giving it, the remote payment P, does that live on the same one? Does it live on something else? Is it a promise for something that lives on a different one? That could involve some extra messages that are not visible. But in this case, it lives on the same this case, it's paid in the same currency. So, so those are going to be collapsed into those, 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 those mm -hmm. there may be two messages there, but they're collapsed yeah, into the same transmission. And so what he was saying here of, you know, the first one looks like one round trip to me, because there's a then, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. the, as is the second one. And so in the case of round trips, the local runtime, which is swing set, I guess, will yeah. keep a bunch of like closures yeah. over yeah. JavaScript. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And uh, do you think that are there any DOS concerns in like a crypto economic context? If I'm a user who wants to consume a lot of memory in closures on your chain, can I delay messages to do that? Or? Uh, so Brian, you know, Brian you know, the other Agoric folks should answer separately. Uh, I have purposely not been thinking those things through at this stage because I want to get the um, capability to to e-rights and higher order contracts, I want to make a first end-to-end -end pass of expressivity, assuming that I've got a working capability system that makes capability progress, and then mm -hmm. only worry about liveness issues with regard to the kinds of things we were all just arguing about, where there's sort of a logical liveness sure, dependency. Yeah. Uh, and with regard to uh, um, any further um, uh, you know, uh, resource exhaustion attack kind of issue, if you guys have any thoughts. The, the, the one thing I have here is that um, you're, you're sending the backing first key to the machine that is hosting the remote issuer. And that promise that you're given, um, the backing first key is the local one to everyone? Okay, so the, 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 the back, so the backing, no. This is the backing first P is on a remote machine, but I'm going to speak a language that Brian understands that I haven't introduced into this discussion. Because of this, then inside here we can assume that the um, uh, no. Uh, okay. Let, let me let me tell you what I intended to say. Um, uh, which is we can assume that those are presences rather than promises, right, right. so that we can they are resolved, they are, but 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 I wanted them to be promises, to be to be presences, so that I could know from their representation that we they would arrive as the real object at, at, at the moment they arrive. So so the, the thing that comes to mind is that um, if if an attacker gives me remote payment P and says, hey, I'd like to like you to translate this into coins on that other system. I'd like you to take this in exchange for that. Um, they're giving me a promise or something. That promise may not resolve for a while. And they have given me a promise that will never resolve. And depending on who I hand that to who's waiting on it, you're consuming some resources on that chain. And the way that our messaging system works, if you give me a promise for something and I set it off to a third party and they're going to wait on it, I send them the promise. I don't wait for it to resolve, for your thing to resolve first before I send it off to them. Sometimes our messages can do that, sometimes they don't. But our goal there is to forward that on as quickly as possible without forcing any pipeline stalls in there. And so there are going to be cases there where there's some central party that is the one that is hosting the, the, the core issuer of this currency, and you're going to hand them a purse, and they're going to be like hanging out waiting for, you have them promised, and they're going to be hanging out waiting for. 
that could represent a, a, a consumption of time. And so we have to figure out how to cover that, how to protect against that. Do you ever run into cycles? What, what you, cycles of what? Cycles of promise dependence. Ah, uh, there's a very interesting empirical issue there, which is uh, because this is a non-blocking computational model, uh, we don't have, in, 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 in some literal sense, we cannot deadlock. But of course, there's a sleight of hand in saying that. Uh, in transforming what you would have expressed as uh, sh in a shared memory system with locks, you instead transform it into something you're expressing with promises and then patterns. And there's a, the cyclic, the cyclic promise resolution dependency is something called a, um, uh, a um, what do we call it? Data lock. Data lock, data lock, thank you. A data lock. Data lock. The data lock is basically, um, uh, this is a promise for what that thing will resolve to, but that thing is, is only going to resolve it when this promise resolves. So, right. so two promises logically dependent on each other. Uh, it's very easy to create data lock examples to demonstrate the problem. Uh, we know of three instances of a diagnosed data lock that happened accidentally. And uh, that's over a tremendous amount of use of, unless you have more information from the door. Well, there's, there's a lot more to say about that. You know, so, so a dead lawyer happening in Hungary or in general? No, no, in, in general. general. They, this they, is, this is, oh, this, this is. Three decades of experience. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, that, that, and that now includes uh, the JavaScript promises that can also experience data lock. Right. So, um, so deadly embrace is, is your, you know, deadlock is generally control flow uh, uh, um, dependency between, you know, A is dependent on B, B is dependent on A from a control flow point of view. Yeah. When you translate that into, into async and promises, there are two things you can do. One is you can turn it into the data flow, which is generally the right thing to do, or you can reconstruct control flow abstractions using, using So in the data flow case, it's, it turns out there's lots of architectural reasons why it's actually rare to create the, the, the data dependency. You know, in general, um, uh, if clients depend on servers, um, if clients depend on servers, it's very hard to cause a cycle. It's only when a server takes a dependency on the client that you suddenly have a, a unexpected opportunity to create a cycle. Yeah, my um, concern is not really accidental creation. It's mostly. more like a malicious user. Okay. So, um, but they can just send you an unresolved promise. And not yeah. So here's not here. Yeah. So yeah. Here, our hypothesis. Uh, I, I won't say it's a conclusion yet, but our hypothesis that I think is actually true is that a malicious actor causing a data lock is only fouling their own nest, is only doing something they could have done by their own misbehavior anyway. Um, the other thing to know about data lock is deadlocks are, are very difficult. Now I'm yeah. speaking very much software engineering. Uh, uh, deadlocks are very difficult to diagnose because you know they can happen one out of a million times. Data locks are as deterministic as any other bug. Yeah, that's a, that, so two elements of that. De uh, uh, deadlock can arise out of taking two correct programs, having them coexist, and now suddenly you're deadlocked. Yeah. Deadlock can't. You've got to have a reference graph in between, so it's not independent things that suddenly collide. Yeah. Um, and then the other is, is, is in terms of those emerging, they're trivial to reproduce, trivial to, to prevent the test, trivial to debug, because it's, you know, you've got a static dependency of pointers here, and everything else can proceed. It's just this part that's not. Now, having said all of the, the giving you the good news about data lock, let me give you the bad news. Um, uh, and by the way, I'm still recording, so here's the bad news for the recording. Um, uh, the, we consider deadlock and data lock and these flow control issues that came up uh, before lunch, um, where you might get stuck because you just don't have enough communication buffers. We call that gridlock. Uh, all of these things are different varieties of what we call lost progress bugs. So where logically you just, you're not proceeding something that you wanted to proceed without being dependent on anything that might choose not to proceed is not proceeding. Um, what we have found in practice in software engineering is that there's a, another lost progress bug that comes to be a practical problem in this, um, in using this uh, programming paradigm which is the lost signal bug, which is 
um, uh, you wrote this piece of code um, expecting to provide a uh, notification to something that will cause something else to wake up and do something. But uh, it was possible for that code to go through a control flow path where it never sent the signal. That's a bug in this piece of code, but it's a bug that's easy. That one's easy to make, whereas data lock bugs are hard to make. Mm. So, and what, what's your idea how to find these bugs? Static, anal Stati static analysis is what I would hope um, uh, to find the bug. And uh, in code review, uh, if you're just aware of it and vigilant, uh, the static, the, if, if it's fairly easy to catch them reliably in a careful code review, that should indicate that you can also do an automated static analysis. But that's, again, a hypothesis. We haven't tried to automate that static analysis at all. So, um, I but, mean, you the problem is, you know, rather on the distributed side, not that you have sort of in the, in the, in the network and the, all the actors that are communicating something which is the problem by the locally, you might be even but even if you want to understand here whether their, you know, the, the amount of, of, of money is still is constant before and after the execution, right? Is it even visible local, or do you have to sort of get the whole snapshot of the whole system? So it's, it's only, so if A is stuck, only things that accepted a vulnerability on A's progress can in turn get stuck. There's no infection of loss, of, of failure to progress on things that were correctly not, you know, not deciding to be vulnerable on A. And, and A's stuckedness is, is the deterministic version of the message, the order of the messages that have arrived at that path. So in terms of like reproducibility and debugging and testing this stuff, it's not a race condition. Um, mm -hmm. different paths. You can, you know. The other way you do lost progress that we, that we did in Midori is oftentimes you know what notification you're expecting. And so you can have abstractions that just label that to the debugger. You know, here, here's where I'm waiting for the user to start you know, to launch the front end. Right? And now, if I can see that my program is in the state where it's waiting for that interesting event and that had not happened, now I know where to go look. Right? You know, I don't, now I know where to start debugging as opposed to, hmm, nothing's happening on my screen. It's a blank screen. What's going on? Right? And so you want to have had things that registered. I'm expecting something sometimes eventually in the future, and now I can see the list of outstanding you know, things that, that, that are interesting events for me. So yeah. uh, the process we will be going through over the next year, over the next decade really, is, is adding more of this annotation to code like this to enable better debugger tools to give us more information. Sort of like where you did make empty first backing. That string, the backing, yeah. is yes. not semantically yeah. interesting yeah, yeah. 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 but it's helpful if you're trying to look at a first object and find out what it's yeah. And so similarly, every time you wait for something, every time you make any promise, you might want to mark it with something that, that the diagnostic tool can present to the model. So have you looked at the previous of previous systems? Do you have some experience there? Or? We, we have a lot of experience with okay. a lot of previous systems. Okay. Uh, and I'll say that um, uh, even with the lost progress bug, which is the most vexing lost, I mean, so even with the, sorry, even with the lost signal bug, which is the most vexing lost progress bug in this paradigm, uh, it's still a paradigm that uh, that j not just myself, but but people who use it who did not construct it uh, can use reliably with respect to these issues. Uh, uh, in my opinion, more reliably than I've seen people use any other paradigm. But that's not a, you know that there's no numbers to back that up. There's no empirical measurement. I mean, who has you know. I hope eventually to have the budget to to bring about such empirical experiments with uh, with programmers. Uh, yeah, I've got you know uh, node callback code versus promise code. There's net, there, there's people that are looking at the comparable reliability of systems producers, right? But I, I don't know the data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as a matter of fact, the uh, I've never so yeah the JavaScript experience, the JavaScript promises. Nice thing about that is that's already probably. Thousands, many thousands of times larger than my experience with E and Dean's experience with Midori and um, Brian's experience with Fool's Cap all added together. Uh, and, I've, and, you know, and I'm on the committee. I hear about things that become interesting bugs that people talk about. I've never heard of 
the entirety of JavaScript practice having a diagnosed data lock button. Obviously, I wouldn't call it that, but I would know the symptoms. Uh, I do see them have lost progress bugs primarily by exceptions that turn into broken promises where nothing reacts to the brokenness of the promise. Mm -hmm. So Node has specifically added diagnostics to recognize when a broken promise has not caused anything to be notified by end of turn. They actually, they actually emit on the console a warning, yeah. and the warning says we will emit an error. And the warning says in a future version this will just terminate the process. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's right, terminate the process. So, but, but the first thing you notice is generally you would expect lost progress bugs to happen through the error path. That's because that's, that's always the control flow that you didn't. You weren't digital the control flow path, you weren't thinking through hard enough when you did code this year. For all of these asynchronous relationships, like over here, when I did the deposit, I didn't have to say anything about the error path. If the deposit signal, if let's say the deposit method threw an error, that thrown error turns into a broken promise. The promise for the result of the then, given just a just a one argument call to then, uh, the argument is not called. And the, bro and the brokenness, the entire diagnostic, not just the fact that it's broken, is propagated through to the promise for the result of the event. So there's this contagion of brokenness. So uh, I agree yeah. with these promises, you're making the caller responsible for dealing with the error cases. Yeah. So, so in the latter case, in the demo, mm -hmm. if slash all slashes or burns, I think we would call yeah, it, we reserve slash for yeah. stating, but, uh, but then the withdraw call fails, times out, ah. or it doesn't go through, okay. what happens? Now so, we're in, now we've broken an invariant, right? That's right, that's right. So uh, so now let's, let's talk about the trust assumptions that this code is making, uh, which is uh, this code is making um, uh, the assumption that, the, the assumption that, that, um, uh, that the expressed computation um, uh, among, if it's among non-malicious parties, uh, then it will eventually go forward according to the code written. And if there is a malicious party in there, uh, then only the things that are modeled as objects that it's hosting, that its malicious behavior is equivalent to those objects misbehaving. Sorry, so guys. I thought we had more time. <laughs> so, so, so I, I, have, I have this slogan, which isn't quite true, but it's still a good slogan, uh, which is, you can reason about all suspicion as if you are suspicious only of objects. So if I don't trust the VAT hosting a set of objects, and I model that as the objects hosted by that VAT can have arbitrarily bizarre misbehavior, I've covered most of the issues. Right. You can pretend that all of those objects are polluting. Every authority, any authority you give to one of them is magically made available to all of them. So this code yeah. does not express a timeout. And this code, as written, in order to have the invariance that it's counting on, assumes that every message sent to a non-malicious receiver eventually gets delivered. Exactly once, of course. Okay. Um, uh, and if you loosen those assumptions, we have to change this code. Well, we might have to change this code, right? Yeah. In some sense, if, if the issue is there is a timeout on the deposit all, that will turn that into a broken promise, and now sequester all will fail with the broken right. you know, deposit right. all timeout. Yeah. If, we, yeah, if we fail here, we're okay. If we yeah. fail here, is the issue being brought up? In the vent. Yeah, I'm looking at, I'm just making sure. So that's a that's, remote, that's a, uh, a, remo a remote withdraw. <coughs> what happens is you've locally destroyed the local currency, and now you, in order to redeem it for some amount of the remote currency, so you initiate the withdrawal of the remote currency. This, by the way, also making a conservation assumption, which is the um, since you're, you can you can at most redeem the amounts that you sequestered, that this won't signal an, an overdrawn of the bank error because no one else was supposed to withdraw money from the vacuum store. And, and this, that, if that assumption is violated again, this can fail. And this could have a uh, on error, you know, yeah. that, you know, 
in the event of an error, then then, yeah. then here's the recovery strategy. So yeah, this will that, yeah, right. This code right now will just propagate the error, and then the user gets a broken promise in response to their redeem, and but but they don't know what has happened and what has not happened. Yeah. Uh, then they can, but but they know since the promise for the remote purse uh, became a broken promise, they know they've been denied access to the remote funds anyway for whatever reason. They know they've been denied access, and then having been denied access to the remote funds, they can then take a look at their local payment object, which they might still be holding, and just see. Have I lost my local funds? In the scenario you're worried about, the answer is yes, they've lost their local funds. So in this case, the user's screwed, but they know that they're screwed. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit different from the peg semantics, at least one way we wrote them, but now the difference would be resolvable by having an on error handler that reverted the local slash. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and, and nothing else, one of those things where playing with variations on that error is really straightforward. You know, you could then bait, you could either reproduce whatever your behavior is here or experiment with stuff and then bake it deeper into the protocol at you know, the point where you know, a particular pattern was common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, a main takeaway here is when you can express these patterns with su such little code, then it's easy to create variations on patterns.